Generally speaking, there are two types of calculus students. The first type of calculus student does not like limits. The second type of calculus student really, really does not like limits. And uh, I can understand that because limits can be confusing, especially when you see them the first time. But I think that they've gone a little bit too maligned. And I really want to take some time. We're going to delve into some of the technical aspects today of limits. Let me preface by uh, what we do today by saying the following. Even if you don't understand the technical aspects of limits, you can still benefit a lot from calculus. In fact, if you go back historically, when calculus was developed, there were no limits. They weren't developed until much, much later. So Newton never did limits, and he got along just fine with calculus. Some might even say he was a calculus pro. So what did Newton do? Well, he had this idea of infinitesimals. And he said, well, look, I want to get two things which are really close together. So it's like uh, if you're looking for, the, say, the slope of a, a line, you need two points, right? Now, if I'm doing a secant line, I have two points which are far apart. So his idea is, well, I'm going to take two points, but my two points are infinitely close together. But they're not the same. That was his thinking. And uh, the annoying thing was that it kind of worked. And he was giving the right answers. And the reason I say it was annoying is you can't have two things be infinitely close together and be different. That's not how the number system works. So this kind of annoyed mathematicians for a long time. So they worked and they were able to fix it by coming up with limits. And the idea was, instead of saying, hey, here's one thing that's infinitely close, let's look at many things, but they're getting arbitrarily close. And that's the idea of limits. All right, so let's get into some of the philosophy, the spirit of limits, and then get into the technical details. So the first thing to remember is that limits are what should happen. So in other words, limits don't tell you what does happen. They say, hey, let's look at your behavior nearby. And based on your behavior nearby, draw some conclusions about what we should expect to occur. And the way we say this is the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l. In other words, x goes to a. So x is getting close to a. Then f of x, which is the object we're examining, is getting close to L. All right, and therefore, what we really should interpret is this as, you know, the function at A, it should be L. And this helps us answer things which are, for example, we call them indeterminates, things which we don't know what their value is. So we can say, well, what should it be? All right, so how do we go from there to getting to the technical definition? Well, the key words here are close. And in fact, there's two notions of closeness. So we have two things getting close. X is getting close to A. F of X is getting close to L. So we have these two things going on simultaneously. Now, how do you measure close? That's a good question. So when we talk about close between numbers, we talk about the distance between numbers which we can say, hey, I, I take the difference, but then I make sure it's a positive value. So we call the absolute value of two numbers. So, so really, we can say that the distance between two numbers is absolute value of x minus y. So this is the distance from x to y. All right, well, that's not so bad. I mean, that seems a reasonable statement to make. Now, it's kind of nice to think of, by the way, of absolute value as being a measurement of distance, because the further on you go in calculus, for example, we'll get into multivariable calculus eventually, right? You know, just have to work our way through the, the reads here of single variable calculus. We're going to see that, oh, you know, there's this notion of, of size and magnitude that, that generalizes. So really, if you can move from thinking absolute value just means get rid of the negative to absolute value says, how far away am I? Then that can help you generalize to much more diverse settings. Okay, back to our technical definition, and it's written here. So, the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l means that for any epsilon greater than 0, there is a delta greater than 0, so that if 0 is less than x minus a is less than delta, then absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Of course, right? Right? Okay, let's start figuring things out. Now, there's a couple things to note. We already talked about absolute value as being distance. 
So we see it's showing up twice. Absolute value of x minus a and absolute value of f of x minus l. So those are our two distances. So what we have here is we say, all right, this is our, we're close in our input. And then the other one says, hey, we're close in our output. All right, so that's making more sense. Now let's see if we can figure out what, what's going on here. So what we need is that if I want to guarantee I'm close to my output, I can do it by making sure I'm close enough in my input. So how do you phrase that? Well, first off, we start with this notion, epsilon is greater than zero. The way that we usually think of the, the epsilon is to think of epsilon as a very small number. If you want to annoy a mathematician, you can say, well, let's take epsilon to be large. And they will just go, oh, no, epsilon's not large. It's a small thing. But OK, so we're trying to say we're close. So, so we're, we want to guarantee that the distance between f of x and l is small. So the way we do that is we say, well, I'm going to be close. And when I say i, the function is going to be close to l when I'm near enough to a. Now, I suppose this is, I'm going to go in a little bit of rambling mode here. We really have two things that we can think about. How close am I in the input? How close am I in the output? Which one can we control? Well, the answer is we have complete control over our input because we can choose how close we are to A. The function then dictates what happens in our output. So we get to choose our closeness and in our input. And so the goal is to make sure that we also can somehow guarantee closeness in the output. So that's why we say, look, how close do I need to be in my output? Here's what you need to do for the input. It might help to sort of visualize this in a picture here. So let's just sort of do a quick sketch here. So I'm going to mark here, here's my A, here's my L. So what's going on? Well, we want to be within epsilon of L. So what that says is that we're going to move up a little bit in the direction up and down. And we're going to get from L minus epsilon up to L plus epsilon. All right. So our goal is we want to have the function be in between here. Now, keep in mind, we only care about what happens nearby. So it's OK if the function is outside of this strip far away. What we want to do is say, when we're close to A, we're inside the strip. So what we want to find is we want to say, look, there's some delta. So in other words, I can go out delta in either direction. And then I can look at this A minus delta, A plus delta. And then what we want to do is no matter how you pick epsilon, you can pick delta so that whatever the function does, you don't care what the function does far away. But inside of here, the function has to stay inside the box. OK. Now it's OK if it stays inside the strip far away. But we, again, limits don't care about what happens nearby, nearby. So to make this sort of a little bit as a reminder, how can we leave the box? So this is OK for us to exit the box. And here it's OK for us to exit the box. So it's OK for us to exit out of the sides. But it is not OK for us to exit out of the top and bottom. So we'll mark that in the genera, in the universal symbol for not OK as a frowny face. So if I leave the box either top or bottom, then that says I have not chosen my delta well enough. Or regardless of how I choose my delta, if I always have to exit that box, then that says that the limit is not L, or possibly that the limit doesn't exist. All right, so that's what we're going for. Now, there's one catch here I haven't talked about. We talked about how, about how f of x has to be close to L and how x has to be close to A. But did you notice this little piece here? This part right here. 
Why, why is that there? Well, what is this saying? So zero is less than x minus a, uh, sorry, less than absolute value of x minus a. What that says is you can ignore a. So there was one piece missing from my picture. Namely, there should be a, a diagonal line here. So I don't care what the function does at a, because the function might not be defined at a, or it might be poorly defined at a. So that's why we add this constraint, because we don't want to know what does happen, so we ignore what does happen. Our goal is to ask the question, what should happen? All right, so where does that leave us? If you want to show that a limit exists, you can think of it kind of as a, as a game. It's maybe not the most exciting game, but it's, it's not a, a bad game. You say, I have a function, and I, I want to show the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l. Well, what I need to do, if, if you give me an epsilon, I'll give you a delta. That's the game. So no matter how much you want me to stay close in the vertical direction, I say, look, as long as you're close enough in the horizontal direction, you're good to go. Now, the choice of delta almost always for most interesting functions depends on your choice for epsilon and sometimes in a very non-trivial way. So it's not an easy game to play. So how do we play the game? Well, there's a couple of tools. And now the most important tool you have, this is the best tool in your box, is the triangle inequality, which says that the absolute value of x plus y is less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. By the way, it works the same if you have absolute value of x minus y. Absolute value of x minus y is less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. Haha, <laughs> okay, all right, good. Now, you might not look at this and say, ooh, triangle, because it doesn't feel very triangle-like. But that's because we're not really seeing the full picture. The notion of why we call it the triangle inequality is because this is really the picture that it's based off of. And what it says is you have sort of a triangle. And I'm going to draw it with little arrows. These represent vectors. If you don't know what vectors are, don't worry. Calculus 3 is coming eventually. You'll get there. All right. So you have an x, you have a y, and this side is x plus y. And what's happening is it says the absolute value of x plus y you should think of as the length of this side of the triangle. So I'm starting here. So here's my start, and I'm ending here. And so to go straight from my start to my end is better than, that's the less than or equal to, first moving along this part and then moving along that part. So in other words, it's always best to go in a straight line. And that's the triangle inequality. Okay, so a couple of useful strategies. And really to see these strategies, you need to get your hands on some examples. We'll do that in the practice. So one thing to keep in mind is we get to make the absolute value of x minus a small. And we have control over that, because remember, we get to pick our delta. So I can always make this piece small. So when I can, I try to say, OK, when I have that f of x minus l, look inside of that expression, and can we find an x minus a in there? If we can, we are really in a good situation. Because what that allows us to do is we say, hey, I can make that part small. Now I just have to make sure it's small enough to compensate for whatever else there is. All right. Another idea, use the triangle inequality. Like I said, it's one of your best tools. What it does, it allows us to break things up into parts. And now we say, let's make each part small. And if we make each part small, then when we add the parts together, the whole thing is small. That's pretty good. All right. Uh, when you have a product, look to make one thing very small and the other part, meh, not big. In other words, bounded. So if you can say, look, this part, which is hard, I can say it's hard, but it can't be arbitrarily big. It's a bounded term. And this part I can make arbitrarily small. You win. Victory. All right. Uh, this will sound strange until you see it in practice. But sometimes what you have is you're trying to find a, a delta that works. And you say, well, if I have a delta that does this, and I have a delta that does that, 
then it would work great. So I want a delta that does both of them. Well, it turns out what you can do is start making a list. Well, I'll pick a delta that satisfies this property, a delta that satisfies that property. And then you come up with like five or six and you're like, well, can I pick a delta that, that does all of them? And the answer is yes. How do you do it? Take the smallest delta. The smallest delta will work for all of them. So that says, look, if you're trying to figure stuff out, say, well, let me choose delta to knock this thing out so I don't have to worry about it. Let me choose delta to knock that thing out and so forth and so on. And as long as you only have a finitely many things that you've done, take the smallest one, life is good. Now, one last piece of advice. Sometimes there's a tendency for us to say, I want to find the best one. That's a bad thing to do. You don't want to find the best one. You want to find the easiest one to work with. And it takes a lot of practice to do this. Generally speaking, try to avoid getting the best one. Really what you're dipping your toes into, this is what in mathematics we call analysis. And in analysis, we care about, okay, let's get into the details. What's big, what's small, what can I control? What, what can I control? And the art of analysis is saying, let me figure out what's important. Let me figure out what I can discard. And I can sort of say, this is unimportant. And it comes with practice. That's one of the hard things because inequalities, they're a little bit harder to work with because they're a little bit more flexible. When you're dealing with equalities, it's like, ooh, it's very rigid. This must equal that. So there's some obvious manipulation. In inequalities, it's not so clear how things work because you're like, well, what am I really getting rid of? What am I really keeping? And so if you try to say, oh, I'm going to go for the absolute best one I can, you're making life harder for yourself. We don't want that. Math is not about making life harder for us. It's about making life better. That's why we study math. All right. I think it's time for some practice now.